Hello, my name is Elif Erdine and I'm the director of Immersion Technologies and Design, MTech postgraduate program at the Architectural Association School of Architecture. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of Next Build Conference and particularly Martin Day for his kind invitation and for bringing this community together. Uh, so briefly, what is MTech? MTech is a postgraduate program, master's program, and we offer Master of Science and Master of Architecture degrees. And we have had a long ongoing interest in urban systems and organizations, their evolution under changing climatic conditions. And at the same time, we have had an ongoing expertise and interest in material systems and behavior and how natural systems uh, can be a resource for developing responsive performance in architecture. And these areas, uh, in combination with the newly founded research interest in digital fabrication, and particularly robotic fabrication techniques, are tied to solve design problems in extreme biomes. This is kind of what constitutes our multi-scalar research approach. And through our research, the question that um, we are trying to answer is how are we going to build our cities for the future? In today's talk, I will focus on two key aspects of our design research agendas, technology, particularly robotic fabrication, and sustainability through material efficiency, and how these can be explored and researched via collaboration between academia and the industry. So the talk is going to discuss the ever-growing role of architectural production technologies in the built environment, particularly robotic fabrication, and the ongoing research of MTech focuses on the evolution of traditional fabrication technologies through the employment of digital fabrication and uh, particularly with an emphasis on reproduction, ro robotic production paradigms. And the presented case studies are going to expand on the significance of collaboration with the industry. Uh, through our collaboration with Bureau Heppold Engineering, uh, one of the pioneering firms in engineering consultancy, and Fibrobeton, experts in GRC shotcrete technology, innovative computational and fabrication workflows have been developed, integrating freeform design, robotic fabrication, uh, as well as fabrication and assembly tolerances. And the prototypes that have been realized that you are going to see shortly uh, through these collaborations serve as proof of concepts into how academia and the practice can work together for sustainable design solutions. So starting with our um, collaboration uh, between MTech and Bureau Heppold Engineering, our research agenda basically has focused on uh, integrating uh, two fabrication techniques, curved folding and robotic incremental sheet forming for the generation of lightweight, stiff building elements. Uh, and the primary contribution of the research uh, is basically the dem demonstration of a methodology that integrates the precise computation of curved folded geometries and the employment of finite element analysis as design drivers for the application of incremental sheet forming um, for the geometrical and, ma and material stiffening of sheet material. So just to give a brief introduction, what is curved folding? It's a highly efficient fabrication method for, fabrica for manufacturing of curved surfaces from flat sheet material without stretching, tearing, or cutting. And RASPIF stands for uh, Robotically Aid Single Point Incremental Forming <clears throat> or Incremental Sheet Forming. And uh, incremental sheet forming is basically a traditional sheet forming technique for inducing plastic deformation on sheet material. And we can automate this process uh, through the use of robotics. Um, this is basically an overall view of uh, the, the computational uh, workflow that we have developed. Uh, we at, in, in uh, MTech have basically expertise in, in developing custom computational workflows and by partnering with Bur uh, who have obviously significant expertise in, in structural engineering and consultancy, we developed this kind of custom um, 
uh, workflow <clears throat> for our research agenda. So here you can see the, the bottom-up and the top-down approach uh, that we developed for um, generating this uh, large-scale prototype. And I will be uh, describing this process. Uh, so our initial experimentation basically uh, was focused on um, evaluating the tolerances between digital uh, generated curved folded elements and physical experiments. As well as establishing the percentage of material uh, that needs to be removed for uh, mountain and valley creases and the fabrication sequences. And this allowed us to basically understand the structural depth that the components could achieve given a, a specific uh, fabrication size limit. And in our case, this was within the range of 40 to 80 millimeters of structural depth. Uh, while simultaneously we also started to observe the structural performance of these components under self-weight. And uh, we basically uh, generated the curved folded elements following a mathematical model called the mirror plane method. Uh, this is a very accurate way of uh, describing uh, curved folded elements. And while we were uh, generating this, this mathematical modeling uh, method, we uh, realized that uh, the base triangles had to approximate uh, an equilateral triangle. Uh, so following that design objective, we came up with several uh, what is called fitness objectives to then revisit the global geometry and to subdivide the global geometry with approximations of equilateral triangles. So we basically ran a multi-objective optimization algorithm uh, for this part um, of the research uh, for, uh, like I said before, subdividing the global geometry. And this uh, video shows iterations uh, of the simulation before it reaches convergence. This was done in Octopus. So once we had uh, the, the approximated uh, global geometry defined, then we applied uh, the mathematical modeling of the component geometry on the global geometry itself, and we generated the, let's say, the final global configuration of the curved folded components. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, with Burahepel, we started um, generating a series of uh, physical and digital experiments to understand the effects of uh, incremental sheet forming, again, starting on a, a component level under self-weight. So uh, how the density, the distribution, the depth of these dents can affect uh, the structural performance uh, on a component level. And uh, as you can see here, a component um, on which uh, incremental sheet forming is applied performs significantly better than a component uh, that uh, does not have uh, this property, the one on the left, uh, both under self-weight and un uh, under pressure uh, load. So uh, the goal uh, was to make use of this observation and apply it on a global scale. Uh, so what we did was uh, to apply incremental sheet forming on areas that are most stressed uh, and this would basically lead to uh, the strengthening of the final geometry uh, which uh, can then perform efficiently under self-weight and self-weight plus wind pressure loading. Uh, this is basically the two-path uh, generation diagram for the dance that we generated for the global geometry and the two-path simulation of creating uh, incremental sheet forming. And this shows the actual physical process of creating uh, plastic deformation via incremental sheet forming, basically. Uh, now, one of the main challenges um, in this research was the, the joints, basically, because um, all of the joints in this prototype um, has a custom geometry. Uh, 
so the challenge lies in designing the joints uh, that are connecting them. And what that means is obviously we have to incorporate the geometrical complexity of these various 3D components. We had to also make sure that there was structural integrity, uh, meaning that we had to ensure a continuous load path throughout the structure. So obviously the, the first idea that we thought uh, of applying was 3D printing, but uh, this was going to take a significant amount of time. Uh, so what we uh, did to improve the time efficiency of the fabrication process was to design a composite joint system comprising of a 3D printed mold and epoxy resin cast in it. And this is basically showing the final configuration uh, of the global geometry with each of the components uh, and the joints that were modeled. And this is the actual assembly process um, that took place in the A premises in London on the outside terrace of the AA. This lasted for several hours, I think it was six or seven hours long. And here you can see the final configuration with the dance and the joints and everything uh, assembled together. And what we did afterwards to evaluate the process was basically um, the final 3D model was uh, 3D scanned and the, and the digital representation uh, of the installation was made and overlaid with the uh, computational model. So this is the 3D scan um, of the model and the terrace. And this is basically the point cloud that you see is the 3D scan. And this is overlaid with the computational uh, model. And you can see um, some of the areas where we observe deflection. And this gave us a really good idea about uh, basically how um, the physical prototype performed and what um, needed to be improved further. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, joinery system uh, was quite challenging because of the custom geometry of each of the joints. Uh, so for further research, we decided to investigate alternative methods to achieve a stiffer component-to-component joinery system. This was one, one of the, the main objectives of the second iteration of our research. Um, and uh, in the second iteration with Bureau Heppel, basically the design aim was to create a, a prototype for Bureau Heppel offices in London that could last for a long period of time. And it was going to be situated on top of the skylight that you see. The skylight is above the entrance area. Uh, so this was the design uh, ambition. Uh, so initially, again, uh, we revisited the component geometry and the connections. And um, like I said, the aim was to uh, induce basically a geometrical complexity by having only one type of joint rather than having a multitude amounts, amounts of joints. So we, we decided to move forward with a single type of uh, box joint, as you can see here on the right. And again, we went back to initial prototyping and testing um, in the studio. Um, and this time, uh, we were basically focused on changing the component size uh, and the geometry, but keeping the joints similar to each other, as opposed to the initial iteration, where uh, the joints uh, were varying, but the components were fairly similar. Uh, so this is the plan and uh, in, an initial assembly sequence. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Bureau Heppel began to conduct a series of uh, analyses on, on the design proposal for the skylight. So here we are seeing the component analysis line model showing the shell elements, uh, component model showing the peak stresses, as well as component deformation. Uh, and here we are seeing the design proposal uh, in, in line with the existing beam on the Bureau Heppel 
appearance and the beams uh, that are placed, existing beams that are placed on the skylight. And some of the analyses showing the uh, prototype under uh, in deflection um, under self weight, uh, as well as self weight uh, and snow load, and showing lateral deflections caused by wind. Uh, and finally, obviously, what was really important uh, was because the prototype would be sitting um, directly on top of the skylight, uh, we I had to understand how uh, the beams on the skylight would be affected. So uh, these are the components, uh, the highlighted ones, showing um, where they actually touch the skylight beams and um, their respective analyses. And uh, this was installed um, back in February, and uh, these are some recent images, so it is still standing. Obviously, um, the, the series of analyses that were conducted by Burahapult has been quite very helpful indeed. And uh, it helped us to refine the design uh, and showing some details. Uh, in this case, uh, just to add a last note on this, the dents were added uh, on the components uh, that would receive the most amount of load, basically. So uh, those specific components were stiffened uh, through robotic incremental sheet forming. And the second case study that uh, I want to present is basically um, the AA Architectural Association Visiting School in Istanbul that um, I have been directed, uh, directing for the past uh, couple of years and our collaboration with Fibrobeton, as I mentioned earlier, Fibrobeton is a, a company that focuses on GRC technology and shot creating. So this research uh, presents a novel approach for the materially efficient production of doubly curved EPS formwork uh, for in situ concrete construction and a novel uh, GRC shotcrete uh, technology application. And the research objectives focus on the development of complex formwork generation and concrete application via advanced computational and robotic methods. And of course, while it is viable to produce formwork, um, with complex geometries, a key consideration for us has been the reduction of former waste material. Um, so basically, we wanted to create formwork with zero waste material. And this initial uh, phase of the research was guided by the digital and physical principles of robotic hot wire cutting. So a short glimpse of the assembly and fabrication process of the final prototype here. Um, in order to take full advantage of robotic hot wire cutting, the geometries um, need to be modeled as ruled surfaces, uh, doubly curved ruled surfaces in this case uh, that you see in diagram A. Uh, and in the context of this current experimentation, basically the straight lines that you see map the moment of the hot wire attached to the end effector of the robot. Uh, and in this selected design proposal, each component is made up of a set of two unique volumes which are generated by cutting a single EPS block uh, with the hot wire cutter. And both generated pieces are part of the global formal configuration of the assembly, thereby generating no waste material. Uh, the algorithm then distributes all of the pieces according to a global configuration system where all the pieces share overlap surfaces. Uh, as we were developing the computational workflow, our partners Fibrobeton uh, were, conduct were conducting uh, physical tests uh, in order to observe and see uh, how much curvature could be induced within a single EPS block uh, to, uh, to make sure to ensure that the GRC spring process could be run smoothly. And this is the um, hot wire cutting um, process in action in studio, showing how each piece was cut and then tacked, and then kind of semi-assembled indoors, and the robotic fabrication setup. 
The spraying process uh, was basically performed in three iterations. Uh, each of these uh, layers um, uh, of shotcrete uh, had different mixture ratios. Uh, in the first and second iterations, the mixture contained fiberglass particles, hence GRC, and the entire structure was sprayed on. Uh, a roll press application after each round uh, tightened the surface connection between EPS GRC and subsequently GRC and GRC. And the last iteration contained only a cement mixture without uh, fiberglass for a smoother surface finish. And this was uh, still the curing process, so this is not the uh, entirely cured version. And these are some of the, let's say, final um, images of, of this first um, round of research. Uh, and basically, uh, after concluding this phase, uh, our ideas to, to extend the research further were, uh, first of all, um, uh, formulated upon the investigation of alternative methods for in situ form work. So basically employing a material system other than EPS to act as in situ form work such that uh, thinner lightweight sections can be achieved. Uh, and our second idea was uh, to experiment with alternative computational workflows to enable increased variation and optimization while considering fabrication times and limitations. Uh, meaning that we uh, wanted to kind of move towards uh, the employment of multi-objective optimization methodologies to integrate multiple design objectives related to a uh, architectural morphology, robotic fabrication constraints, um, as well as uh, structural stability. So the primary contribution uh, of the second, let's say, phase of research uh, is a demonstration of a multi-objective optimization methodology that incorporates geometrical form finding, material and fabrication constraints, and finite element analysis uh, during the early stages of design. And the design and construction uh, of a doubly curved large-scale prototype made of textile reinforced uh, GRC shotcrete this time with a robotically fabricated in situ uh, reinforcement system serves as a case study for the proposed uh, methodology. Uh, as you might be aware, in recent years, evolutionary optimization processes have gained recognition in architecture and related design disciplines. Um, and the application of multi-objective optimization is not only limited to academic research, uh, but it, it has also been extended uh, to professional practices as well. Uh, and our researchers, our PhD researchers in MTech, uh, basically have developed an evolutionary multi-objective -ob optimization solver engine called Wallace C. Uh, and this um, engine basically allows users to run evolutionary simulations in Grasshopper through utilizing highly detailed analytic tools coupled with various uh, comprehensive selection methods. So I will describe a little bit this computational workflow. So uh, this process obviously starts with the selection of a design idea and uh, the parameterization of a design, and then a random population of um, design candidates are generated, and these basically start to be optimized in uh, generations according to the uh, fitness objectives that the user provides the algorithm with. And uh, as I said, generations of design candidates uh, are produced uh, in this way and uh, they are evaluated iteratively. Uh, and uh, after uh, the analysis uh, of the candidates, a selection is made and finally fabricated. So this was the design idea um, that we wanted to basically generate in, in this phase of research, a kind of a seating area uh, or they say an urban furniture. And uh, we parameterize the design. Uh, so what is called genes that you see at the top uh, are basically used for uh, manipulating the morphology of the geometry. 
And in our case, uh, we had three fitness objectives. So the first one being uh, to minimize the structural displacement of the global geometry through finite element analysis. The second one uh, was, uh, let's say, more functional um, in the sense that um, the objective was to evolve the phenotype towards developing flat surfaces to serve as seating areas. And the third fitness objective uh, was basically uh, executed to evolve the phenotypes to use as fewer metal rods as possible for the in-situ reinforcement system. So this was more of a cost optimization um, type of fitness objective. And by running the multi-objective um, evolutionary simulation, 3,000 uh, phenotypes uh, with uh, three fitness values per solution <coughs> were produced. Um, and of course, here the visual analysis and recognition uh, of the fitness performance of each individual <coughs> is very important. You can see how each individual um, is performing in the diamond chart. Um, that outlines the fitness objectives. And of course, the analysis of the data um, associated with each phenotype plays a very significant role in the selection of the candidates. And this is why uh, Volusi is, is a very useful uh, engine because it allows the user uh, to visually analyze uh, all of the design solutions and to make informed decisions because uh, as you can see, uh, morphologically, the design candidates might look similar, uh, but in terms of fitness objectives, they are not performing in the same way. So in the end, uh, we basically selected a design solution that was uh, performing uh, best on average level, uh, meaning considering all of the fitness objectives. And finally, uh, we started fabricating um, the selected design uh, candidate. So this is showing the custom developed uh, robotic road banding um, setup, uh, including the jig, uh, the security area, the banding area, the actuation area, and so on and so forth. And these are the robotically fabricated um, steel roads that would be placed uh, under the textile mesh. And this is the assembly process uh, before the mesh was applied. And here we see uh, the mesh being applied uh, on the steel rods. And the fixing of the mesh. And finally, the application of the GRC via shotcreting. And obviously, in this case, shotcrete was applied uh, both uh, on top of the surface and at the bottom of the surface to make sure that the steel rods and the textile mesh would stay uh, inside. And again, this process it was conducted uh, several times. We had, again, uh, three layers uh, of shotcrete with different mixtures of fiberglass. And of course, as you can see, one of the limitations here was the resolution of the final prototype. Uh, you can observe some uh, jagged areas, basically. And this is uh, one of the further research aims that uh, we are going to address in the future. And this is showing the partially completed uh, prototype, showing the mesh inside the GRC. Um, so this, again, takes me back to my initial point uh, about how uh, these kinds of research collaborations between academia and practice uh, can give way uh, to, to address uh, technological as well as sustainability-related issues. And uh, through our collaboration uh, with both uh, Bura Heppold and Fibra Beton, uh, we were able to develop uh, custom computational workflows and we were able to integrate 
um, our expertise in, in different areas related to computational design, structural engineering, material manufacturing. Um, and uh, one last point that I would like to make uh, pertaining to this is that obviously publications are quite important for us. Uh, so these research collaborations that we have had with Fibrobeton and Brahepold have been widely published in, in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. Uh, in order to share, uh, obviously, our research results with the with the architectural and scientific community, um, and I would like to uh, also thank uh, once again uh, to uh, both Fibrobeton and Brahepold uh, for their consultancy and their in-kind sponsorship for our research. And finally, uh, please feel free to visit our uh, website to get more information uh, on our ongoing research. And I would like to thank once again to Next Build and Martin Day for their kind invitation to this conference. Thank you.